This episode is brought to you by Kia's first three-row all-electric SUV. The Kia EV9. With available all-wheel drive and seating for up to seven adults. With a zero to 60 speed that thrills you one minute. And available reclining lounge seats that unwind you the next. Visit kia.com slash EV9 to learn more. Ask your Kia dealer for availability. No system, no matter how advanced, can compensate for all driver error and or driving conditions. Always drive safely. I'm Jason Palmer, one of the hosts of The Intelligence, The Economist's daily current affairs podcast. The Economist's award-winning shows make sense of what matters, from our special series on China's president to our weekly podcasts on business, technology, and American politics, our journalists provide fair, in-depth reporting on the events shaping the world. Search for Economist Podcasts Plus and sign up to our free one-month trial. Hey everyone, today's guest is Mark Tremonti, lead guitarist for the Tallahassee, Florida rock band Creed. Together we break down the writing, recording, and inspiration behind the smash hit single, Higher, taken from their 1999 album, Human Clay. Talk about evading the sophomore slump. Creed came roaring back with the first single from their second album. Hot off the heels of their huge debut album, My Own Prison, it sounds like the band didn't have much time to think about anything except writing new songs. Mark explained that Hire was bored out of sound checks, where he recalls jamming the core of the song with the band, as Creed didn't really record demos back then. I enlightened Mark to some things about the song that he didn't even remember, such as producer John Kurzweig's involvement, playing the organ throughout most of the track. This contribution is not something you would probably hear if the song were playing in your car, a bar, or sporting event. But in headphones, it's there in all its glory, adding a killer element underneath the enormity of the song. Oh, and Mark just might be one of the hardest working guys in rock and roll. Mad respect. So for all this and a ton more, stick around and let's get higher. Hey, hey, have you heard? Krista makes a podcast. Hey, hey, have you heard? Krista makes a podcast. Hey, hey, have you heard? Krista makes a podcast. Hey, hey, have you heard? Krista makes a podcast. Good morning, Mark. Good morning. How are you? I'm doing great. You you have the honor of being one of the earliest uh, guests. I don't like to ruin the illusion here. I like people to think whenever they're listening that this is live, but it's not. But uh, yeah, you're you're up bright and early. I like that. I am too. This is actually my second interview of the morning. So it's uh, I, I did the I started at eight a.m. this morning. I absolutely love it. Well, listen, I, I, I want to start off by saying congratulations. I've I followed your career. Uh, I, I've known about Creed since you guys started because we were kind of next door neighbors. You guys were over in Tallahassee, and less than Jake was over in Gainesville. So this, the story is pretty fascinating, but I want to start off by saying congratulations uh, on the Creed reunion. This thing is just, you know, for one of the most hated bands, you guys were hated before Nickelback. You guys were the original OGs. <laughs> it was quite a, quite a time. You know, it's, it seems like everybody's, you know, since the announcement, man, all it's, it's just been pure love. So it's been great. Well, that that's awesome. And of course, you know, uh, let's not discount Alter Bridge. And that's where I ran into you recently. We were doing festivals together. Uh, th- this band, I mean, look what you've accomplished there, what you've done with Tremonti. And then this is probably the fifth time I've told you this through text when I saw you. But uh, the Frank Sinatra uh, covers record that you did, Tremonti Sings Sinatra, uh, <laughs> released a couple of years ago uh, with proceeds going to the National Down Syndrome Society. I can't believe I, I, that that's you singing that. It sounds like something that was recorded back in the 50s or 60s. It's so cool. Well, thank you. It was uh, one of the most exciting things I've ever done in the studio. You know, working with those guys was it was it was nuts. You know, sharing the stage with guys that shared the stage with Frank Sinatra is just blowing my mind. Use your mentality. Wake up to reality. But each time that I do, just the thought of you makes me stop before I begin. Cause I've got you under my skin. 
how difficult, I mean, obviously you have some natural ability with that, but did they push you in the studio or did you just get and sing the songs a couple of times and they did a vocal comp or? No, you know, Mike, Mike Smith, who was Frank Sinatra's band leader for some time back in the day, he, he tried to direct me a little bit on the first song, but I think then he realized, all right, you know, you know, you, you practiced, you know, he's like, you know, when, when, when the old man did this or did that, he would uh, phrase it like this. I'm like, well. Mike, listen, listen to what I'm referring to. I'm referring to this recording. It's like, okay, you got it, kid. You know what you're doing. <laughs> so you had actually studied recordings of, of his, not just, you know, you, you'd went maybe listen to live stuff. Oh man, I'd listen to everything. I, I, uh, I went, I wanted the deep dive. I wanted to make sure I knew everything about his approach, not only when he was an older guy, but, uh, from his early career and, I studied from start to finish everything I could. And I, I, you know, I went online a deep dive on trying to find people teaching you how to sing like Frank Sinatra. And everybody who did, does a lesson on how to sing like Frank Sinatra sounds nothing like Frank Sinatra. <laughs> so I was like, you know, you got to do it, do it yourself. You know, just, just, just listen, just as a guitar player, you hear stuff and you're like, you know what? After a few years, you can, you can hear if somebody's playing on a G string or a D string because of that wound string and that unwound string. Right. Same thing with a vocal. If you listen hard enough, you can hear the little placements of the voice and, all the little nuances. Well, it, it's fabulous for everyone listening. Check that out. Uh, Tremonti sings Sinatra. It, it blew it blew my mind. But you know, getting back to to the early '90s, I mean, there was some noise coming out of, of Tallahassee. There was this little band called Crete, and I was hearing about you guys. And I can't remember uh, an old engineer in a studio in Gainesville. I don't know if you do. You remember Mike Rodolante? Does that name ring a bell? I do not. No, no. Okay, I think I think Mike did maybe sound for you guys. Maybe it might have been locally and uh, you know in Tallahassee for a little while. But there was this noise of this band, and then the next thing I know, this record comes out. And you had recorded the first album, My Own Prison, in John Kurzweig, the producer's house. Yeah. I mean, it was like in, in his bedroom or something, right? Oh, yeah. We would, uh, I was working at Chili's at the time. Scott Staff was working at Ruby Tuesdays. Flip was, our drummer was was working at the uh, a knife store at the mall. And then, and then uh, <laughs> Brian, you know, Brian. His father was a doctor, so he was he was rich, and he got to just go to school. But uh, but, ah. we, uh, but we put the um, our monies together to to pay. I think it was thirty bucks an hour back in the time to go to John Kerswick's studio and recorded my own prison, and that was that was a lot of fun. And and look what that record did. Of course, it was remixed after it was initially released, but four singles from the album, My Own Prison, Torn, What's This Life For, and One, a uh, huge mass of songs. And I got to ask you. Was there any, because I love, I love the story here. You guys just, again, you were, you were flipping burgers. You were a line cook. Mm -hmm. The next thing you know, you record this record in the bedroom. It's starting to blow up around Florida. Label comes sniffing, you get it remixed and it just becomes, you know, what looks like this overnight sensation. Now you got to do the follow up. Oh yeah. Was there any pressure? Was there any any thought uh, of oh man, we have to repeat this? Yeah, back in the day, man, the rock and roll roll world when you're in it back in those days was not rooting for you. Everybody's trying to give you hurdles and, and trying to chop you down. So from when we had our first single come out, uh, My Own Prison, it went number one on the rock charts, and then everybody's like, you know, most bands have their one hit wonders, and uh, you know, you better soak it in now because you're not going to be here tomorrow. And then we we put out torn i think it was our second single and that went number one we're like all right we're still surviving and then they're like all right well maybe as your first record is great but you're gonna have a sophomore slump on your next record and then we come out with higher and that's our, our was our biggest song at the time so we just kept on you know having to prove ourselves year after year and uh yeah it's just the way of the world man people see some success and like well you're not going to be successful if you don't do this or don't do that but i think at the end of the day if you just Keep your head down, work hard, and write songs that you believe in. Other people are going to. Well, and I got to tell you, by the late 90s, you remember everyone, Gene Simmons, rock is dead, rock is dead. And here you got a band like Creed that comes out. You know, I, I always stood up for you guys. I was like, they're, they're four guys playing their instruments. They're not running tracks here. There's no DJ. Yes. Yeah, people would be like, yeah, Creed's a corporate band put together by, you know, record label. Like, what are you talking about? We're four dudes that met, you know, college and. Yeah, I mean, I met Scott in high school, but we're just just like any other four idiots in college that get in the band together and, <laughs> and find some luck. Well, a couple of things here. The record uh, Human Clay was released September 28th, 99. It was preceded by the first single Hire by a month, came out August 24th of that year. Interestingly enough, though, uh, Mark, the track uh, Hire was number nine 
out of 11 on the record. Did nobody hear that as a single initially? That seems like it's buried. Oh, no, we, we knew that was going to be a single. That was I remember being in the studio for that. And uh, it's so funny. When I listen back to that song, I remember the uh, ADAT recorders. We recorded that oh, yeah. on ADAT. So when we were listening to the mix of that, you know, it's one of those things where you hear it played back. You're like, all right, this is a good one. We know it's going to, it works for what we do. I think it's going to, I think we knew it was the first single. Uh, I remember the first time hearing it on the radio, I was with my uh, wife and we were buying furniture for our first home at, uh, I forget where it was, but I remember hearing it on the radio and being uh, pretty excited about it. So of course you're excited about it. It's the next single, it's the next record, but you had already heard yourself on the radio. So you're still getting excited at that point. That's awesome. I think what excited me was the, the DJ who played it like, wow, Creed's coming back, swinging for the fences with this one kind of thing. You know, they, they, they dug it. So I, when you hear it, uh, received so well it was it was a good good moment well that's when i kind of started to peek behind the curtains a little bit i'm like okay this guy likes maiden or something this isn't you know because it was the guitar lick the hook in this song and the choruses and i remember yeah. hearing this song for the first time like man this is this is pretty heavy and for the next follow-up single the sophomore slump you guys hit it out of the park yeah you know, we were the entire time we were doing it we were fighting for survival you know this is all we ever wanted to do it I, I don't think it was until we did uh I always felt like I was, uh, you know, on the verge of not having a career anymore because of all the doubts and all the struggles. But uh, once we hit Alter Bridge AB3 record, I was finally like, you know what? I've been doing it this long. I think if, if you just keep on keeping on and working hard, we can do this as long as we want. So it took that long to feel comfortable, you know, with with this career. Yeah, I don't care how many records anybody has sold, how many concert tickets. There's always that. Am, am I going to be I don't know if the word's relevant, but am I going to be doing this in a year? Yeah. Right. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and it's yeah, I finally I finally feel like with as many projects that I have going on, I could I could I could keep on going for for quite some time, thankfully. And, and again, uh, was there any discussion of, and why was this track nine out of 11? That does seem odd to me as a single. Usually that'd be the second, third or fourth track on an album. Back then people yeah. bought albums. I, you know, it's funny. I don't even remember the order of, of the, the records. You know, I remember, you know, my own prison, I think I could, I could rattle it off pretty well, but as far as the other records, I don't know if I, I know the order anymore. I, human clay start with what if maybe <laughs> I'm not sure. Fair enough. I've, I always joke on the show. It's not like we sit around and, and, and uh, analyze and listen to our own records. I, I totally well, people get that. People ask me how to play certain songs. Well, I have no idea. I'd have to realize. Yeah. I've got I've got 18 records now. There's no way I'm yeah. going to remember even. They're like, what do you mean you don't know how to play it? You wrote it. It's like, yeah. dude, I got 400 songs. You yeah. don't get it. Yeah. Uh, real quick, John Kurzweig, uh, engineered, produced, and mixed uh, the track higher. Uh, of course, he's worked with you. You guys you know, put him on the map. Is it safe to say he was kind of the, the fifth ingredient back in the day? He was just an experienced guy. You know, we hadn't, we hadn't met anybody like that, you know, at the time we were just, uh, right. Around by just college musicians. He, he was the only guy we knew in town that had a record deal in the past. I think he was signed to Atlantic records back in the day. Yeah. He put out a solo record in 87. I had, I had, uh, seen in, when I was uh, researching all of this. So yeah, he had, he had this career, but you know, a lot of times the local guy that, you know, he's, He's not the greatest. He's just your buddy. And I mean, you stumbled across a pretty good find here. Yeah, no, he was, and he was meticulous. What bummed me out is I would, I'd be ready to get out of Chili's and go over to, to track my guitars and I'd haul ass over there and uh, it would be raining outside. And he's like, oh, we can't record today. You can hear the rain on the roof. I'm like, come on, dude, you can't hear the rain. He's like, no, we, got, <laughs> we can't track today. So he was that meticulous. He, he did have like a steel roof so you could hear it a little bit, but it would. Yeah. yeah, I don't think it would have mattered too much, but uh, he took what he did very seriously, and he, he was a gentleman, and uh, he was great. That is really cool. Well, do you remember writing higher? Was it after the first record? I, was it on tour for my own prison? You guys were out, you were noodling with the riffs, or the only thing I remember is, is messing around with it at Soundcheck. You know, we used to do this thing where we would try to write songs in the moment. Sometimes in the early days when it didn't matter in college, we'd be like, all right, we're going to write a song with you guys on stage. All right, Mark, write a play, start playing a riff, and st Scott would start singing over it. I think we were just on stage sound checking, and I was I was just playing um, the music to hire, and, and Scott kicked out that chorus, you know, and it was just in the moment. And uh, I think we were like, all right, we're on to something here, and that was kind of the, you know, the birth of that song. Were you demoing in these days? Is there a demo of Hire, or would you just get the parts together and then go jam them and, and get with John and, and, and pre-production, or how'd it come about that way? No, we, we didn't really have 
super proper demos. We we would record stuff here and there, but it was uh, we we used to have a gentleman named Ron Renew that would follow us around with video cameras. So we have tons of old footage of uh, us as kids in college just playing our first uh, shows. It's funny. I just saw a video of us playing a full show at the place where we got our first record deal. And you would think that we were a, a metal band because the crowd's all moshing and it's college. Nobody, yeah. nobody knew who Creed was at the time. It was just a, you know, we'd kick into a heavy riff and the whole place would would go nuts. So it was uh, it was the early days before anybody knew of us. So it's cool to see those. And there's a lot of songs I'd forgotten about that I'm like, you know, we could polish those things off and put out, you know, put them out someday. But was that uh, was that at Floyd's, the Cow House? Was Where Floyd's, was that at? Floyd's Music Store. It was Floyd's. Yeah. Okay. That's actually the same place I met my wife. Very cool. You know, and that was had nothing to do with the concert. That was just a that was me and my buddy were gonna go pick somebody up. To, it was one of the bartenders that we were friends with. We we're gonna go grab him, and that's when I, you know, my wife was happened to be there. That's awesome. And didn't they used to do shows on the campus? I think we played there a couple times. We played everywhere there, but uh, I know we did. Uh, was it Fat Tuesdays where? Matchbox 20 got their record deal. Um, uh, yeah, uh, that's right. Yeah, I was there. I was there that night where um, it was uh, it was Matchbox 20. They were in there. I think they had a different name. Tabitha Secret, I think it was called. Yes. And yeah. they were in there doing a show, a showcase. And I think after that show, they got a, a, an offer. So I was, I think, I think I was at the show where they got they got uh, discovered by label. That's awesome. Well, uh, we're going to jump into the track now, Mark. And I went ahead with the album version. You know, a lot of times I'll do the single version of, of a song that was big enough. And certainly I think it, at least as many people have heard the single version probably as the album version or more. But I went with the album version. I thought it was important here because, um, I don't know, I, I felt that the parts that were omitted uh, were really cool. So I wanted to talk about them. The track is five minutes and 16 seconds, hence why they whittled it down a little yeah. bit for radio. It was a, a, a little bit long. The intro is these clean stereo guitars. The first thing we hear is the pickup note of uh, the stereo guitar panned off to the right, followed by eight bars of a moving riff in drop. D before the band kicks in right here is where the radio edit you didn't you omitted that first part but this is this is where the song would have started but i love i love the mood and the tone that that creates uh when the band kicks in it's drums bass and big distorted stereo guitars join us for eight more bars and that riff from the top continues through for eight more bars but gets bigger there before uh we get into verse one I know that Scott wrote these lyrics, but we're gonna I'm gonna read these lyrics and uh, we're gonna talk about them a little bit. And there's a lot going on in verse one. I want to talk about musically. Yeah. When dreaming, I'm guided to another world, time and time again. At sunrise, I fight to stay asleep because I don't want to leave the comfort of this place. Because there's a hunger, a longing to escape from the life I live when I'm awake. And you know, you guys got a lot of grief for being, uh, you know, having religious overtones, you know, and when I was a kid, I liked Striper and Slayer just the same. My, yeah. my listeners know that I've, I've said that before, uh, but these lyrics, they sound pretty positive to me. They sound like they're coming from a good place, you know, and, and religious or not, it just, the song, the song feels good. What, what does this verse mean to you? Uh, to me, it's just escapism, you know, it's the, uh, being able to, to, uh, escape the, tethers of normal life or the fetters of normal life and just going and, and uh being in your dream state where life is good and when you wake up from a dream sometimes you're like damn it let me get back let me get back to what it was because now i got to go to work flipping burgers at chili's right you know and speaking of the the religious overtones you know one thing you got to say about scott stapp 
in general still to this day is he you know he caught a lot of grief and as a band you know just just a guilty by association thing we would get the same thing i never really took any offense to it whatsoever but scott as much as as much as he took heat for that he never backed down from it never changed his tune never it never affected him he's like i believe what i believe and you got to respect him for that you know good for him well yeah and you know it's um especially when you're being thrown into the public light like you guys were at that point i mean this record sold 10 million copies that's diamond certification not many bands do that yeah you know, michael jackson def leppard i mean th these are think about that yeah no it was a it was a pretty you know at the time we were kids it seemed like and uh you appreciate the hell out of it, but you don't really appreciate it as, as much as when you, you know, you start another band called Alter Bridge and you see how hard that fight is to get uh, to get the radio play, to get the record sales. And I've lived both sides of that fence. I've been in the band like Creed, where you have the huge amount of uh, record sales and radio play, but you also have the, the critics and people lashing out at you. But then I've been in Alter Bridge where it's tougher to sell as many records but you have the critical acclaim so i've gotten to see both sides of the fence yeah and and just the fact that you've gotten where you've gotten with alter bridge out not many people go outside of their bands and and can you know it, it's very very difficult i've always said the band is the sum of its parts but verse one a lot of cool things and i think you've already answered this question this record wasn't done to pro tools no. you did it on no. adat oh yeah adat mm -hmm. oh not even to take ADATs were a nightmare. Remember they used to have oh, to yeah. chase each other and it was just, well, I, I, didn't, I didn't know anything about it. I'm just sitting on the couch and you say, all right, ready? Here we go. I don't know how he put it together. I don't know how ADATs, uh, what the process was other than sitting back there and just being excited. Do you remember any primitive editing on a computer? Like after he would take the ADATs and dump them and, and you wouldn't be able to do what you could do now, move vocals around, but you could move sections. Yeah. I don't remember ever overdubbing anything it was it was kind of like here here's your take and then you would just put it in there. I, it was it was record whatever tone you got it wasn't a second yeah. take. whatever is clean we're gonna hit that whatever's dirty we're gonna hit that all in one chunk you know and it, the right were how it was shot like you said you take the first verse and once it hits that pre-chorus or that chorus and it hits the dirty guitars whenever the different tone sections are that's what we would cut the dirties in this song especially the chugga chuggas in the pre-chorus and we're going to get there mm -hmm. I've never heard a tone like these big stereo guitars in this particular track ever again. Huh. I've never I mean I I know your tone but there's something about this song that's just these stereos are massive. You know, I can't remember what amp I used either back then. I, it was uh I think I might have had one of those old Hughes and Kettner uh before the before the Hughes and Kettner came out with the fancy lit up amp. There was one before. I think it was a Tax 100 or something like that. I forget. But um, I combined that with some other amp. I don't know what it was back in the day. That, I think this was this was before I could afford a Mesa Boogie rectifier. Some of the craziest, biggest guitar tones are just uh, swap and mix and match. Yeah. I know that. I've had guys on this show. It's like, yeah, I borrowed my buddy's amp last minute, and I got this massive guitar sound. You know, and you try to replicate it again, and then you're like, you don't know what you did. Oh yeah, I was just watching something on the on the uh, the Kinks and. Um, they were talking about when when he recorded one of the first kind of heavy metal sounding guitars. He took an amp, a little amp that he bought, little little blue. I forget the name of it. And he took razor blades and he cut away from the cone, and uh, that sound made it sound like this overdriven kind of distorted metal tone. They say you know that's how he started to invent the heavy metal tones. That is awesome. Well, verse one here, the big stereo guitars they decay from the intro. They are out by the lyric time again drums bass and clean stereos are strumming with some what i'm calling in between single note playfulness here uh the bass tones ripping the bass the where the bass sits in this is really interesting too it's it's it doesn't hit you in the face it has its own place kind of back here but it but it's really big and on the line because there's a hunger a longing to escape an organ hand off right swells in here kind of sounds like a leslie it's really buried mm. but what a layer Cause there's a hunger, a longing to escape from the life I live when I'm on. Yeah, you know, I I can't even I can't even remember that layer, to be honest with you. We're going down memory lane. Um, I don't know what John would have used. Mark, I've never heard it before. I've heard this song uh, hundreds, hundreds yeah. of times. 
I've never heard this until I got in headphones and really listen. I'm like, wow, there are some overtones. I think it's a Leslie or something. It, it yeah. is so cool and and it builds. And back in those days, you couldn't break out your laptop and just have a synthetic version of it. You're, you know, right. you got to have your a Leslie, a real thing. In all fairness, when you went back home for the night, that could have been John sitting there doing a lot of this that you never even saw him track. Yeah, it could have been. But I think he would have told us, in this, unless we just forgot and we just saw him doing it. Hey, whatever he did, he knocked it out of the park. It's there. Absolutely. Well, uh, right there, we get into pre-chorus one. And pre-chorus one, I'll say it later somewhere in, in my notes here, but I'm going to make the argument that that this is almost as catchy as the chorus. Yeah, yeah. Well, it sets it up. It does. It, it's a moment. So let's go there. Let's make our escape. Come on, let's go there. So let's go there. Let's make our escape. Come on, let's go there. Let's ask, can we stay? Hey man, you want to stay out of that out of that reality where you're flipping, like I said, where you're flipping burgers and you're living the dream, you know? Literally living the dream. That's awesome. Well, I'm calling it these menacing, chugging stereo guitars come in here and really separates this part from verse one. That organ is still present, panned off right, and it really adds a cool tension. On the last line, let's ask, can we stay? The guitar, uh, kind of in the last chord, goes up this octave to launch uh, into chorus one. Pre-chorus one here, the vocals sound doubled, Mark. They don't sound doubled in verse one. Is that where they, they, they might have got doubled? I'm not sure, to be honest with you. It's a tight double. It's not loose, but yeah. it's I, I can hear uh, what, what sounds like some movement in there. Uh, chorus one. Can you take me higher to a place where blind men see? Can you take me higher to a place with golden streets? I would guess that that's a biblical reference of some sort, you know, because uh, Scott had a, a very uh, uh, religious upbringing. You know, both of his parents were diehard church attendees. And, and um, Scott would tell me, you know, if he ever got in any trouble, he'd get sent up to his room to, hey, go go study this Bible verse and give me a essay on what what it means to you so he's very well versed in in every you know inside and out of the bible so that i think when somebody's going to write poetry of any sort you're going to go with what you uh what you've studied and what you're familiar with so that's you know a lot of what had to do with him referring to the bible a lot well i always thought that hooks uh in a song had to be lyrical hooks when i was a kid you know oh the, the hook is the chorus right but Man, we get, we get some hooks that aren't vocals here in Chorus 1, Mark, and it's after the first Can You Take Me Higher. We get the bow, 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 bow. <laughs> When I heard that, I, I was in my car when I first heard this song. We're going back 25 years. And when I heard that, I was like, that's when I was like, I got to peek behind the curtains here. There, there's, some, there's some metal influence going on here. That's not a <laughs> 90s alternative uh, uh, grunge riff or whatever you want to call it, the, the, what was happening during that time period. What was that all about? Did, that, did you just fly that in the studio, rip it at one point, and the, everyone liked it? It's, it's such a cool part. Well, you know, I was, I was always the only guitar player, other than bass, obviously, in the band. So I was trying to fill out as much space as I could. I tried to do keep it as interesting as possible without just strumming chords and, and try to tap little lead parts in with the rhythm parts. And, you know, I always picture myself on stage. What's going to be, what's going to be fun, just strumming the chords or doing a little lick here and there and you know, just try to keep it, in, you know, interesting. How many hands you see in the air do the air guitar to that part? Hey, you know, it's, I, I hope I can see him uh, next summer when we're back out there. Hey, everybody, don't go anywhere. We got lots more with Mark Tremonti coming right up after a few words from our sponsors. Hey, this is Mike Wiebe, and I'm the singer in a band called The Riverboat Gamblers. And I'm Zach Blair. I play guitar in a band called Rise Against. Mike and I also have a band called The Draculas, and we also have this great, amazing new podcast called Zach and Mike Make Three. 
Yeah, each week we're going to ask ourselves and we're going to ask our guests what three favorite things they are into at that moment or in their entire lives. And then we're either going to agree with them or we're going to make fun of them. And uh, you're going to listen to it and you're going to like it or we will make fun of you. How about that? I just flipped it on you, the person listening to this right now. But we're going to do it every week here on the Sound Talent Network. Once again, it's called Zach and Mike Make Three. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And now back to the show. Uh, we go right into verse two. It's the same overall instrumentation uh, as verse one, but there's a couple other things. Oh, I would like a world to change. It helps me to appreciate those nights and those dreams. But my friend, I'd sacrifice all those nights if I can make the earth and my Although I would like our world to change, it helps me to appreciate those nights and those dreams. But my friend, I'd sacrifice all those nights if I could make the earth and my dreams the same. The only difference is to let love replace all our hate. Yeah, I mean, to me, that's that's uh, could work better in these times. You know, it seems like the world's a jacked up place at the moment. And um, I think he's saying those lyrics in reality, life is 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 got its ups and downs. It would be great if we could... Uh, if it could all be, you know, these uh, pie in the sky ideas or these these dreamlike states you have that are that are perfection, and I would give up all those dreams if I could make it a reality. The songs are really major, positive, especially the lyric. But there's also kind of like a sadness. To this song I get. Do you feel that? Like a like a desperation, and I, I I don't know why with such a positive lyric. Yeah, well, I mean, when you hear like you know we need to replace all the hatred in the world, that's a sad thing, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, on the line, it helps me to appreciate those stereo guitars like verse one. They finally fade out. And then we get like a keyboard on the next line. Those nights in those dreams. Uh, it's like an organ swell, just very subtle that happens. Uh, if I could make the earth of my dreams the same, a noodly organ, uh, super buried comes in here. Uh, it's kind of swirling right and left. And when I say buried, it is just you would almost never hear it cruising down the road with car noise. The earth and my dreams the same The only difference is to You know, I'm going to have to go back and listen now. You're <laughs> turning me on to things I, I, I don't remember. It is so cool. You're going you're gonna to trip out when you, when you uh, be, uh, listen in headphones, yeah. put your AirPods on or something. It's, it, it's really cool. The last line, to let love replace all our hate, there's an organ swell, and it kind of does a slide, uh, a finger slide on the organ to take us into pre-chorus two. So let's go there. Let's make our escape. Come on, let's go there. Same lyrics as pre-chorus one. At this point, wh why mess with the formula? You're not going to add any more information here. The, the, the words are perfect in the pre-chorus, right? Yeah, absolutely. Don't overcomplicate it. We kind of did that later on in our, in our career. If you listen to the song Time, which is, I think, our best song. I think we all agree. Time on the Full Circle Records is the best song we ever recorded. But verse one and verse two have different melodies, which isn't very common. No, that's, that's a risk. That's a risk to take, but but sometimes that's really cool, yeah. and that's what what you know makes you talk about that song. Oh, the ver second verse isn't, isn't like the first. You know, with Scott being your primary songwriting partner in Creed, Mark, did you ever find like, you know, he'd bring in a lyric that you didn't like or didn't think felt the song? Would you talk about that, or was it just Scott's vision? Here's my music, and and what's your vision with this? No, I mean, I would when I worked with Scott, I would uh, I would write the music, and then I. I write a lot of melodies as well. And I would throw out lyrics like on the first record, you know, what's this life for? I wrote a lot of lyrics for what's this life for? I wrote the lyrics to torn and then, and then scattered lyrics throughout. And then Scott would take his lyrics. And in the early days, you know, no, it was, every, I thought I'd, I would never second guess anything. I think it wasn't until the only time I ever second guessed uh, Scott's lyrics were on the full circle record when we were doing 
we were doing a song. It was the ballad. I think Walk Away in Silence it was called. And he started speaking in another language. Whoa. And uh, I'm like, hey, hey, man, um, after his explanation of it, he's like, you know, that's how, you know, it was something I'm saying to my wife or this and that. I'm like, hey, man, if it's a, a rock song, I don't care if it's Spanish, Greek, whatever it is. I think you need to just, just stay English. I, I think it's I don't know. It's, it's jarring. It was jarring to me. And he. He, he gave in and he, he agreed in the end. But Well, I've never had that happen in my band. No one's ever come in and wanted to speak a different language. I'd probably have a difficult time with that too, Mark. Yeah, you know, the only time I've ever th- considered it was uh, Frank Sinatra does an incredible version of Ave Maria in Italian. Like, yeah, oh, that would be fun. That would be a good challenge. Unless you're saying so- you're, you're speaking Italian and you say something stupid, and I'd have to have, a, <laughs> I'd have, to have <laughs> one of my relatives listen to it, make sure I'm not saying something wrong. There you go. Well, pre-chorus two, same overall instrumentation as pre-chorus one, but the organ, and and more so, its overtones seem a bit more present here in in pre-chorus two, which I like because that's building that's building the track, building the song. Uh, chorus two. Can you take me higher to a place where blind men see? Can you take me higher to a place with golden streets? Same lyric. We get that guitar hook after Can You Take Me Higher. The lower bendy guitar lick on the second line. The guitar hook the third time. There's a great pinch harmonic uh, off to the right. You were channeling your inner Zach Wilde there, I think, Mark. There you go. Love me some Zach, for sure. There you go. I I love the pinch harmonic there. And then... What I think is one of the coolest parts of the song is you go right back and it doesn't happen again. I love the placement of pre-chorus three. We don't hear it again. And like I said at the top, uh, it's almost as hooky as the chorus, this part to me. Uh, It's a great setup for what happens next, which is the guitar solo. So let's go there. Yeah, let's go there. Come on, let's go there. Let's ask, can we stay? But this time on the first line, you get a let's go there from Scott that's echoed off to the left. Uh, Let's go there on line two. It's echoed to the right. Uh, And on line three, come on, let's go there. You get that whole line uh, panned off to the left. And there's an arpeggiated organ part. I'm calling it uh, the Twilight Zone part here, Mark. It's like doo doo doo. It's like a three note thing. It's buried again off to the right, a little more audible than some of the other uh, parts. And it is killer. Uh, Those vocals that I was talking about with Scott a moment ago, they're kind of like filtered, like back calling responses. And interestingly enough, up to this point, it dawned on me. I said, where's the harmonies in this song? They don't happen until the bridge. Right, yeah. Do you recall talking about that? You want They, they wanted to save it till later? Because certainly there was there was uh, room for harmony uh, in, in the chorus of this song. Yeah, well, like you said, you know, it's, it's building a song. It's, it's You don't want to start at the top. You got to build. You got to build up. So everything is just, you know, you're on this roller coaster to the top. But uh, back then, you know, it wasn't the harmonies and the doubling of the vocals wasn't as prevalent as 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 it's had gotten over the years so back then it was it was just stripped down and bare kind of compared to what what uh bands are doing now in production it's uh like even the leslie layer in there isn't isn't something that uh we did a, a ton right yeah well again it, it's four guys playing playing in a rock band that's what this sounds like it, this isn't an overblown production it's a really big production but uh you, you you can tell it's just uh still still four guys in a band the guitar solo comes in after pre-chorus three and i can't state enough i love that pre-chorus three doesn't happen again but it does happen three times as i feel it had to happen three times yeah. it's darn near as catchy uh, as the chorus
Up high, I feel like I'm alive for the very first time. Set up high, I'm strong enough. Take these dreams and make them mine. Uh, before the pre-chorus lyric starts, there's like this spaceship sound that happens. It's almost like a, a Tom Scholz from Boston rock man. Uh, like when uh, you turn that thing on full blast. Well, I, did have, I did have a rock man. I had a bunch of little racks. Maybe I brought one in for the studio. Who knows? I'm telling you, it sounds like this spaceship thing happening. It's such a cool way to enter into this bridge. Uh, and we get our first harmonies on very first time. They're subtle, but it's the first harmony in the song. We also get a vocal harmony on Take These Dreams and a vocal harmony on Make Them Mine. At the end of this section, these big octave guitars come in. They strike with the band. It's just like this whole part crescendos, and it really helps uh, set up uh, the next eight bars of what I'm calling a musical interlude before the second half of the bridge. Now, this part, I didn't A-B them that closely, Mark, but if I were to guess, I think this was another part that was clipped for the radio edit. Probably. I mean, we had to we had to find the places that didn't have vocals and any musical part and chop them in half. So, yeah, I'm sure that that bridge got chopped in half. But I went with the album version because I love this part. Yeah. I love that it dips down to this musical interlude and then it comes back for the bridge uh, before you get to the, the the double chorus at the end. Again, you don't go back to that that pre-chorus. We don't hear that again. So I think it's cool. You know, when we play live, we're playing the radio edit because it's such a you know such a widely known version of that song. We're not playing the, the album edit like we normally would do. I don't think I don't think any of us even remember the album version. So you're telling me I should have done the radio version. We got you got to come back. We got to do the radio version now, Mark. Yeah. Jeez. <laughs> you know, it's it was like I said, it was so widely played and heard and performed. We it's almost like the the uh, record version is just long forgotten unless you're a diehard that's listening to the actual album. And isn't that funny how that happens? I mean, you you couldn't help that the song sold 17 gazillion copies and it became you know, one of your signature songs. So you're going to play what the audience knows, right? It destroyed the original version in a good way. Yeah. Sometimes you don't know better. You know, when we're recording a record, we're like, no, this is the way the song should be. And the, the record label's wrong. Radio folks are wrong. They're They're destroying our art. Hey, maybe maybe they were right in this case. I just read Getty Lee's new book, and he has a quote in there. It says, uh, mixing is the death of hope. And I'm like, what does mm. that mean? I started to read it, and it was like, yeah, when you're recording, you're hearing all these overtones and these parts, and they're pushing your vocal up. And now when it's mixed, it's like, Where'd, where'd my part go? Where'd my part go? I need the guitars louder. You know that fight. We all go through it. Oh, yeah. We've had that many a times. I remember when we did... Uh the only the only time we had to have a slight disagreement with John Kurzweig was on this record when we did the song Faceless Man. We have the beat on an offbeat, and he had he put it on the beat on the one, and we're like, wait, yeah, uh, no. He's like, no, it just sounds wrong. We're like, no, it's it's just the way the song is, and we kind of battled over. It. Finally, we got our way, but Faceless Man is another one of those songs that we think is probably the second best song we've ever done, and I'm glad we uh, stood up for ourselves. Sometimes you got to you got to stick the producer in the corner and say no, we're right. Yeah. And sometimes we are right. Uh this second half of this bridge, this musical interlude, it's reminiscent of the very top of the song. We get an o o at the end, kind of this delayed thing off to the left by Scott, another o o to the right, and then the o o the third time becomes centered and that echoes into the lyric, set up high. I'm strong enough to take these dreams and make them mine. However, we don't get any harmonies here on the vocals. Clean strum stereo guitars come in for this part. Single bass notes and sporadic hits on the ride cymbal. Uh, and make them mine. After that lyric, there's a cool swell into these big stereo guitars and a huge drum fill that takes us into chorus three, and we get a guitar slide in right there off to the right. Wow! <laughs> that uh, takes us in for this double chorus.
Some cool things happen here, and I have a feeling you're not going to know. I was going to kind of quiz you. You're not going to know. You haven't listened to this in forever. Uh, double chorus right uh, after Can You Take Me Higher. We get that guitar hook, and man, there is a really killer, busy bass run. I say busy, not in a bad way, that happens right after that line. Doesn't happen elsewhere in the song. It's killer. Uh, to a place where blind men see, we get that lower bendy guitar part, and on Can You Take Me Higher, the third line guitar hook comes back in this time it is a crazy squeal pinch harmonic off to the right you gotta build the song man you gotta have the biggest one at the end there you go i'm I'm glad i'm glad you saved it mark and then the second half of the chorus again the lyric is exactly the same uh after can you take me higher the guitar hook happens we get a harmony vocal harmony onto a place where blind men see it's a really loose vocal harmony but on that line on the second line, doesn't happen anywhere else in the song, we get the high guitar hook again. Yes, sir. And then it happens on the third line, and there's a guitar hook. And the last line, to a place with golden streets, we get a vocal harmony on that as well. The band ends here, and on the fade out, you get a super high guitar uh, harmonic panned left, and you can really hear that organ part trickle off to the right, and the song uh, ends. You know, you wouldn't hear these layers again driving down the road or jogging, listening to it, or just casually hearing it in a bar or a restaurant or wherever you're going to hear this song. When you sit with uh, with headphones and listen to the overtones of what's going on underneath the band, it's 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 really really cool. Awesome, man. Well, I need to do that. It's been a, it's been a long time. <laughs> but I haven't put on uh, a lot of Creed records until we started announcing the tours, and then we. I think we were at the beach, had a party, put some music on. I was like, oh, man, forget about this track. We're going to have to pull these out. And isn't isn't that weird? And, and you go back and if, have you ever struggled? Have you ever been like, how do I play that? Because oh, yeah. I have. I've, I've went back and like, what am I doing oh, here? A lot of times the part will get buried. I'm, I'm yeah, I, I, I have to. Uh, nowadays, when I write a song in an album, I have a file on my computer that tells me exactly how I play everything. Um, but anything, <laughs> anything before Ultra Bridge 3. I have I have to relearn again by ear, so it's uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a task. You know what I do a lot of times is I'll get on YouTube and say, "How do I play What If" by Creed? I was gonna say, you know, when I'm you know I like to pick up a guitar and go through songs on here, and sometimes I I don't know what's going on. It's like above my skill set, so I'll go on YouTube and man. You just start getting, okay, this guy butchered it. It's wrong. I could hear off the bat, this guy's wrong. Yeah. And finally, you'll find the guy. It's like, okay, yeah, yeah. he knows what's going on. Absolutely. But, uh, it's, so, it's very helpful. Yeah. Sometimes you have to dig. Well, listen, uh, thank you so much for carving out some time to sit in uh, here today. I, I Nothing but respect, man. Thank You're just much. out there working year after year i'm stoked to see uh what happens with the creed reunion i know it's going to be huge i've mentioned a lot of what you got going on but before we break anything else you'd like to leave the listeners with here's your uh, here's your shot well since it's uh since we're right around the corner from christmas i just put out a christmas record with the with the guys i recorded the sinatra record with and uh plus 23 stringed instruments and a percussion session and a uh and a choir so it's it's uh, it was a lot of fun. That just came out. It's called Mark Tremonti Christmas Classics New and Old. Like I said, we got a show here this this Saturday performing it. So I, I'm really excited about it. I'm not laughing to laugh. I'm just I'm smiling. I mean, yeah. it's just it's great that you're doing that. It's really it's a different look and it, it, and it's cool. Yeah, I, I mean, that's how I got into the Sinatra thing. I was singing Christmas songs and uh, like you know this this lower stuff really suits my suits my range better than the rock singing high all the time. So. Yeah, no, it's been a lot of fun. So hopefully I can do volume two one day. Awesome, man. Thanks so much, Mark. Thank you. Fly me to the moon. Let me play among the stars. Let me see what spring is like on a Jupiter and Mars. In other words, hold my hand. In other words, baby, kiss me. I can't believe how much Mark sounds like Frank Sinatra on these songs. Go check it out. It's incredible. And I hope you all enjoyed this episode, but don't go anywhere. We got lots more Chris to Makes a Podcast coming right up after a few words from our sponsors.
Hi, this is Chad Nicefield. And this is Justin Press. We're the host of Making Waves, the Shiprock Podcast, a part of the Sound Talent Media Podcast Network. We're inviting you to sail away with us on an epic journey in musical enlightenment. Every week, we bring you only the best artists in rock music and discuss everything from the cruise to the stage to the saga of being a professional recording artist. We'll have lots of special guests along the way, so tune in every week. Your stateroom is available every Monday morning, so welcome aboard. Welcome to this week's Band You Might Not Know. If you'd like your band to be considered for Krista Makes a Podcast, email your best song and a short bio to bandyoumightnotknow at gmail.com. This week's featured artist is Run Motor Run, a five-piece high-energy rock band from San Francisco, California that blends punk rock, Scandinavian rock and roll, and early 90s grunge. Interesting mix, and they most likely have that market cornered. You can find their music on all the streaming platforms. Here's a snippet of their song, Organisms. Rap with Chris and Chris. Chris, I'm glad we finally got Mark on the show. I've been trying to get him for a long time. And I got to say, it's pretty inspiring to hear that these guys went from working at Chili's and Ruby Tuesdays and a knife store at the mall to being one of the biggest rock bands. Yeah, you know, they, they got a lot of hate, whether people think it was deserved or not. What Mark said is true. They were just four knucklehead college buddies that were playing in a band. They record this record. Uh, in between flipping burgers at their their buddy's house that ends up getting picked up by a, a subsidiary major record label, remixed, thrown out there, and becomes one of the biggest selling debut albums of all time. Basically, a, a demo. Yeah. And hey, as far as the hate goes, you got to be something to be hated. If people are <laughs> indifferent to you, then you're not doing anything right. You know, if you have a lot of haters, take that amount and multiply it by like five, 10, some, some number. That's how many people that love what you're doing. Hey, I love the impromptu in the moment style of writing this song. Did they say that they were at sound check when they just started riffing. Yeah. You know, to they, write I this mean, song? you got to think, I mean, they, it, after the first record, they just were thrusted into into tour mode. They were out there. So where are you going to write songs? The back of the bus or, or at sound checks? So yeah, kind of kind kind of makes sense. But uh, they weren't demoing. That was interesting. They didn't really have the the means to demo. When he said they, they kind of would send stuff around, it's probably a cassette. Like, hey, check out this riff. Can you can you write some lyrics over it, Scott? Right. Hey, do you guys in Less Than Jake ever get the opportunity to like? work on songs on stage at sound check. I mean, you guys have some longer sound checks when you're headlining. Do you ever do that? We do. Uh, we, we filmed a couple videos at sound check in the past couple of years. We did one for the last track on silver linings, our record from 2020 There's a song called so much less that we recorded. Uh, it's funny. It's funny. We recorded it at the marquee, uh, out in Tempe, Tempe, Arizona and came back and recorded our come dancing live portions at the same venue about a year later. So yeah, we, we take the liberty of sound checks to, to work on stuff. Sometimes you can't get a much better, I don't know, environment. It's kind of inspiring. You're in this venue and you have all your best, equipment and maybe you have your in-ears running. It just seems like an ideal environment. I'm just never in that environment where I have hours long sound checks. I'm in a practice space when when we're writing. But uh, I think that's that's pretty neat. That's a pretty neat way to write songs. Um, I also think, you know, when you're going back to this time and you're recording to ADAT, they didn't record this to Pro Tools. There's something beautiful about recording with a set of limitations to a certain extent. And every step of the way, knowing you don't have the luxury of, oh, we're going to go back and fix that. Don't worry about that. For right now, that's just a placeholder. What you're doing is what has to be there. I mean, I think that's actually really cool. Well, you're, you're, you're making yourself a better player. You know, I've always said you, you, there's no way in the 70s, 80s, even now, like really good session players, they don't come in and take 30 takes. 
they come in and kill it. That that that's what they do. And I I was never that good. I'm still not that good. I have to really work at at playing guitar. And you know, we'd make recordings back in the day, and they would get done. It's like okay, now I have to learn how to play this. You know, right. what parts am I gonna <laughs> what parts am I gonna omit that don't need to be there? I can't play three guitar parts at once that I layered. What what's gonna be the forefront live? Dude, that's so funny. I've been doing that lately. We have some punchline shows coming up where we're playing some songs that we haven't played in a decade or never played. They were album tracks that we never played. And I have to go back and be like, what What am I playing here? What am I doing? And I think it's so funny that both Mark and you said that at some point... <laughs> You've gone on YouTube to find some kid that's playing it on there and be like, oh, that's what I'm doing. I think that's pretty inspiring for all the YouTubers out there making the how-to videos. <laughs> you know, I love watching a good how-to play something video on YouTube. Yeah, I've had to research my own stuff, other band stuff before, and, and uh, you'll, you'll, you'll find some bad videos, incorrect videos, not bad, in, very incorrect. Uh, but sometimes you'll stumble across it, like I said, like, oh, this guy's got, got, got his act together. But uh, man, you, you talk about you know the old sophomore slump it didn't happen to these guys i mean mark and it sounds like they didn't have much time to think about it they went from the tour straight into recording the next record and uh yeah mark didn't have an answer i'm still a little bit perplexed why they would have buried uh the the arguably one of the biggest songs of their career number nine out of 11 uh back when you would forefront the album well you know you you'd put the the top songs up uh, in the front of the album yeah it's interesting i guess it doesn't matter to the radio and like where it is on the album and i guess maybe maybe we overthink that you know mm -hmm. at this point it really doesn't matter to be honest in the days of streaming i don't know if you noticed this chris but unless you have some giant massive single whatever is track one on your album is probably going to be the one that gets the most singles now so you better really front load your album if you believe in a song now you know we used to be pretty artsy about it i think we <laughs> in my band we still kind of are but i think as we're about to finish a new album we better think hard like we better put whatever the best song is first because that's the one that's going to get the most streams and speaking of first chris it's the first of the year happy new year something i didn't even say to mark happy new year this is the first episode uh, of the year 2024 we made it i like that it's an even year that feels lucky right it does it does i think it's a leap year as well is that correct yes it is a leap year and if you're thinking about taking the leap uh -oh. into joining <laughs> into joining the krista makes a podcast supporting cast now's a great time to do it if you love the show if you love what we're doing and you want to get bonus episodes and an enormous like years worth of back episodes where you learn about music you have some laughs you learn some stuff it's just a great supplementary episode to each week's episode you can go to christamakes.com to sign up for our supporting cast it's the perfect time to do it that's right thank you for supporting what chris and i absolutely love doing we got a lot of great stuff planned for 2024 give us a follow on instagram we have a krista makes a podcast instagram page we just started it chris Man, you've been throwing up a lot of really, really cool videos up there. A lot of cool content, so go check that out. Also, the Krista Makes Official YouTube page. Go over there and uh, peruse that. Chris uh, has been in there as well, putting up a lot of great content. And also give Chris a follow on Instagram at less than Chris Fafalius? No, at less than Chris D. That's me. <laughs> do, you, do you want me to make le at less than Chris Fafalius? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm a fan. <laughs> me too. Give him a follow at... Chris Fafalius, not less than. And uh, yeah, go over to our Facebook page and join the Facebook group. Chris, there's like 5,300 members in there now. I can't even believe it. Yeah, yeah, we have a good time over there. We, we're just tackling every corner of the internet with Chris to Makes a Podcast. That's right. No stone unturned. And also, before I forget, because how could I forget? It's how we end every episode. want to thank this week's guest for sitting in with us, Mark Tremonti. And we'll see you next week. Do you like to laugh, geek out on music, and learn all about that band or artist who had that one song back in the day, but then seemed to fall off the face of the earth? If so, you need to subscribe to One Hit Thunder. Together with an array of interesting and hilarious guests, we do a weekly dive into one hit wonders like Eiffel 65's Blue, Crayshon's Gucci Gucci, EMF's Unbelievable, Delamitri's Roll to Me, Los Del Rio's Macarena, Musical Youth's Past the Duchy, and even Patrick Swayze's She's Like the Wind. So are you subscribed to One Hit Thunder or what? As Desiree would say, you gotta be. And as K7 would encourage, you gotta come baby come and join in on the fun of the One Hit Thunder podcast. Come, baby, come.
come, baby, baby, come, 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 baby, come, baby, baby, come. Hey, this is Dewey Halpas, host of Peer Pleasure on the Sound Talent Media Podcast Network. Join me each week as I explore another long form conversation with one of your favorite musicians, actors, comedians, or creatives. From Chino Moreno of the Deftones, John Gorley of Portugal, the man, to Fat Mike from No Effects, and Ian Mackay from Fugazi and Minor Threat, we go all over the map. From Fallout Boy to Slayer, Peer Pleasure has it all. Check us out now on Sound Talent Media. Hey, this is Chris Santos, host of Delirious Nomads, the Blacklight Media Podcast, part of the Sound Talent Media Podcast Network. Delirious Nomads is a podcast about all things heavy metal, as well as breakdowns of your favorite combat sports. And me being a chef and all, we'll be riffing on some food talk every week with very special guests from across the globe. Listen and subscribe at SoundTalentMedia.com.